Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, uh, today's talk will be uh, about enhancing cybersecurity um, through case engineering in a uh, cloud native environment. Uh, before we start, let me introduce myself and my uh, friend Shayan. I'm Rafi Karabi. Uh, I've been in the cloud native security uh, since 2017, and I've been working with Sysdig um, since uh, four years right now, mainly advocating customers in Europe and Middle East around cloud native security and observability. Uh, for those who don't know Sysdig, we are a cloud native um, security and observability platform. We are offering protection and observability for your cloud native assets, and we are the company behind FALCO, the open source threat detection and response uh, donated to FALCO uh, to a CNCF and being uh, promoted uh, back in, uh, in February. And hey guys, my name is Shayan. I'm a senior software engineer at a company called Harness, uh, where we sort of focus on software delivery. So we create products around uh, cloud cost management, chaos engineering, CI, CD, things like that. Uh, I've also been a maintainer of Litmus Chaos for the past two to four years, uh, which is a CNCF incubating project uh, on chaos engineering. And uh, I've also been associated with CNCF through LFX uh, mentorships and uh, been an active chaos engineering practitioner. So you can find my social media links uh, as well on the slide. Awesome. Uh, so what we have today, uh, part of the agenda, the first thing we'll be uh, talking about the cloud native uh, application and the difference in the threat landscape. Uh, then we'll be introducing uh, case engineering and cyber resiliency, and we will link this uh, to, uh, to uh, how to enhance the cyber security using case engineering uh, practice. Uh, we'll talk about the solution that uh, we're presenting today, uh, the way that we combine uh, both the case engineering and the threat detection and response uh, to build the best um, uh, robust uh, and resilient system. Um, and finally, we'll be talking about the tools that we choose, um, uh, and they are open source. On the second half, we'll be looking at uh, a real hands-on demo of how you can do chaos engineering in practice. We'll take a look at the next steps uh, and the takeaways from this uh, talk. Nice. So um, let's say um, in the legacy world, uh, it was a little bit uh, more or less easy to protect your application because usually they are either inside the VM or they are running on the physical services. And the usual way that you've been running to protect those applications is just putting a firewall in front of this application and you'll be able to detect any abnormal or um, intrusion. Uh, this is no longer the case when it comes to cloud because, uh, first of all, the cloud is exposed, it's a public services, and even if you have an hybrid environment, it's still, uh, you are still exposing to, um, uh, to the, to, uh, to the uh, real world. So also we have uh, this kind of services that are part of your infrastructure that um, help you um, to innovate and build faster, but uh, the problem actually that the team, they are owning those services, that they can instantiate services, they may be um, misconfigured and so on, and you need to control the access for the services, both for your, uh, for your team and your, for uh, the service account that you are using. Um, and because this is uh, bring a lot of services talking together, it will be really hard uh, to detect any unusual uh, activity under the hood. So in a national, um, if we take a cloud native application, uh, you, we can see that it's coming with uh, workloads that are running as containers, are running as serverless, or maybe just a VM that you shifted and lifted from your on-prem environment and they are running on top of Kubernetes or uh, container as a services, either they are public or in cloud, but you have all these, um, let's say, um, surrounded services that you need, like storage, like management services, uh, service bus, and so on, using identity and access management as well, and of course, all the networking and security services. And you see, it's, it's going from a simple application that is running on a VM to a big picture like this. So the main challenge is that uh, the surface attack become very, very dynamic um, regarding to these services that you can uh, spin up very easily. And the threat actors today, they are using the same tools. Let's say that if you are using Terraform or any other tool uh, to easily deploy your cloud infrastructure, the attackers will be the same tools to speed the attack. So it's, it's a race between you and them. And the GPUs system and the microservice oriented architecture will arise the attack surface by generating a long number of, uh, of, of calls uh, within the distributed system. Um, the other challenge that you have today that um, the legacy tools are not um, attended um, into, to, uh, to cover the cloud security in terms of visibility. And by the end, you will find yourself that the delivery is much faster than security uh, um, uh, procedures that you are applying. So this is the, must, um, the top challenges. 
Now, building software in this cloud native era is a lot more complicated than it used to be because we have to think about how our softwares run on a different environment. We have to manage CI and deployment. And uh, we also use advanced DevOps practices like Canary releases. So we need to handle multiple environments and uh, things like dev development, staging, production, and keep everything in sync uh, and with good configuration. So not just that, but security has become more and more complicated too with focus on zero trust environments, testing, monitoring, everything is crucial now. And we also compared, uh, if we compare this to the past, we see that we just had a couple of pipelines to manage, uh, but today's cloud native world has new challenges and new opportunities which we should embrace and also think about how we can make our systems more reliable. Now, uh, the cloud native applications often depend on many different microservices and platforms, which can increase the risk of failures. In the old days of DevOps, we'd build our software and deploy it, uh, but now we're building and shipping much more, often 10 times more uh, than before. In this rapid cycle, we sometimes also overlook testing the underlying infrastructure, uh, which can lead to issues that are hard to spot. With so many moving parts, it is also crucial that uh, every layer of our system is thoroughly tested to maintain uh, the reliability. And to understand reliability better, let's uh, take a look at what causes downtimes. Now, we know that downtimes refer to a period where a system or service is unreliable and uh, it goes down due to various issues. We'll take a look at some of the issues, uh, but a few common issues would be the uh, operational failures like uh, capacity problems or ineffective incident management, uh, something like application failures, which could be due to excessive logging that slows down your system, uh, or things like infrastructural failures like uh, unavailable regions or network outages. Uh, now, to understand how this can impact or these impacts could be significant, let's take a look at a few examples. We'll start with an SLA violation uh, that happened in Slack, which led to $8 million payout which did not only impact the company's revenue, but also their reputation. We'll also take an example of Wells Fargo, where a simple power shutdown in a data center, which happened due to smoke, caused loss of transaction, and their direct deposit checks weren't really reflecting in the accounts. So a single hour of downtime costed around $100,000. Uh, lastly, we'll take another look at uh, British Airways, where around 400 flights were canceled, 55,000 passengers were stranded. Uh, which was around $100 million uh, in losses. When we did a root cause analysis, they found that uh, it was a debugging issue in one of the servers, which cascaded to the other servers, which impacted the billing system. So we see how important uh, managing your downtimes is, and larger organizations like LinkedIn, Facebook, etc., are uh, also practicing chaos today. Now, we can't really overlook this, <laughs> which is uh, the recent crowd strike outage, which had a major impact across the industry. And it not only reflected the security posture of uh, you know, numerous businesses, but also highlighted the reliance that we have on cloud-based solutions today. And it is crucial that we have uh, like a robust, reliable system to plan uh, ma how we can manage such critical failures. Now, we also often are faced by bad actors that are constantly trying to uh, look out for vulnerabilities to exploit within our cloud native system. And with the increasing complexity, we often uh, see that attackers find more opportunities to breach systems and access your sensitive data. Uh, they target weaknesses in the microservices and uh, often use the underlying infrastructure to find and exploit security gaps. Um, and therefore, it is crucial that we uh, stay vigilant and uh, secure our systems ag against these uh, ever-evolving bad actors or threats. So that is where we introduce uh, chaos engineering. Now, what, how can we define it? Chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a system in order to build confidence in your system's capability to withstand any kind of disruptions in production. Or to put it simply, we intentionally break stuff uh, in a controlled environment to check the resilience of your system. So, okay, um, why we, uh, what is the case engineering um, in, in the cybersecurity? The case engineering in the cybersecurity is the fact that you're using the same patterns and practice um, applied to cybersecurity by uh, introducing a controlled um, um, case system um, to measure the system resiliency and discover uh, unknown uh, patterns for your resiliency in terms of cybersecurity. Um, I put here the definition from Mitigant, yeah. Uh, so, um, one question it, would, it may come to your mind, uh, we, have, we have already some great uh, team strategies. We have pen testing, we have adversary emulation, why we need case engineering? 
And that's a good question. So let's let's see the difference between the three of them and what, what is bringing more by case engineering. First of all, the pen testing um, is usually focusing on specific assets and it's defining um, a limited scope. You are not testing your own infrastructure. You are testing uh, a web application or a part of your infrastructure. And also, um, they are conducted periodically. There is usually uh, companies that don't uh, run pen testing uh, in a continuous way. <coughs> On the second hand, um, the adversity emulation is usually um, um, run against like uh, specific threat actors um, and attack scenario, um, usually in a specific um, geopolitical scenario. And you are fo focusing mainly uh, on a specific attack voxel that is coming and techniques that is coming from, from a particular adversity or a threat group. Uh, on the other side, uh, the security case engineering will be uh, mainly um, introducing control failure uh, to know the unknown and to observe how the system is responding to this um, uh, to these attacks or this case um, scenarios and uh, recover from it. And it's um, usually because it's a new uh, paradigm in the cloud native um, ecosystem, it's usually an ongoing uh, practice that you can include in your uh, CICD pipeline, for example. So in a nutshell, uh, this is the main uh, advantage that coming uh, with case engineering in terms of security. Uh, you have a proactive approach that you can apply. Um, you can integrate it easily in your security pipeline, um, and also it will provide you uh, with the continuous feedback and improvement uh, to your system. So let's see where we can practice chaos, security chaos engineering effectively as of today. Uh, we generally don't recommend going head first into production because uh, you want, might want to test the waters. So we'll start with your local environment for initial testing, and then you move to the development environment to simulate disruptions during the build process. So next, once you're comfortable, you use the staging environment to see how the system handles issues in a setting that mimics production. And finally, when you're happy that um, everything is pretty good, we are using the same setup in production, you can apply chaos engineering in the production environment to uh, ensure your system remains resilient. Now, reliability isn't usually a direct goal in security, but it does impact the final product or service as we address other challenges. It is important to check that the system's known resilience remains intact and that no new bugs are being introduced. Uh, so make sure you're not inadvertently compromising reliability because you're practicing chaos engineering. So considering how much developer time is being spent, uh, you should see that if fixing reliability issues is a thing you should do, or you know, introducing chaos engineering is something you should do. Now, these are certain uh, processes or principles that we follow when we do chaos engineering. It is generally a methodical approach to enhance your system's resilience, so there's like a few processes that we should uh, do in a stepwise manner. So starting with first step being selecting the system that you would want to target first, then you choose the fault to simulate your hypothesis. Uh, and hypothesis could be anything that uh, would sort of construct your chaos scenario. So secondly, the, uh, thirdly, the chaos scenario that you would run would have all the faults that you selected. And when you're injecting this chaos, you should uh, lastly observe the results to validate and improve your system uh, and use those learnings uh, after your chaos is finished. Some of the existing solutions that are present today often take a reactive approach, which means they focus on root cause analysis rather than you know, proactive failure testing. So it's always like something has happened and now we'll find out how and why, uh, but they are not you know, upfront, they are not proactively doing a failure testing. They often lack automation and are driven by ops team. They are not really integrated into CICD, which means you are losing on automation. Uh, and also there's no active practice of game days today. So this result in missed opportunities for early failure detection and system improvements. So a better approach that we suggest is to emphasize on the collaboration through a centralized control plane for your chaos experiments and uh, offer robust and ready to use experiments via either a public or private hub or like a central repository where you can host a plethora of uh, multiple faults which you can pick and choose rather than going and creating, itself, creating them yourself. Uh, also, it should integrate into your CI CD system for automation and provide observability with metrics to assess your impact. So this would help manage your SLOs and errors. So we did discuss about some of the solutions that are better, but is it really the best solution when we are considering security? Uh, we have to do a bit more since it's security chaos engineering. So we have to gain kernel level visibility, which allows us to detect sophisticated threats that traditional methods might miss. 
Um, our, off, our approach offers uh, comprehensive security coverage and should address potential uh, blind spots that exist in the chaos engineering framework today. Uh, and also with the real-time threat detection, it's easier that as and when the newer threats or attackers are coming in, uh, we can respond more quickly to uh, security incidents. So we should have the ability to create our own customized rules or uh, policies to ensure that uh, certain security measures are taken and no bad actors can uh, inject anything in your system. So um, today we uh, will pick for you two potential tools that uh, you can uh, use. Both of them are open source and uh, both of them are CNCF projects. The first one is uh, Falco, uh, which is uh, the cloud native security uh, tools designed for Linux system for containers, Kubernetes, and the cloud. Um, and it's provide uh, real-time detection for, for the threat based on the rules in, yeah, and it, that you define. And the second one is Litmus Chaos, which is the open source uh, cloud native chaos engineering tool. So it's a CNCF incubating project as of now, and you can use it to simulate uh, multiple faults and create your own via an SDK and then sort of simulate a hypothesis and chaos scenario out of it. So let's take a look at uh, the architecture of it on a brief overview, and then we'll take a deeper dive into the individual uh, chaos injection, how it happens. So in the middle, we have the chaos center. So there are two uh, aspects. There's a control plane and there's an execution plane. So in the control plane in the middle, we have the chaos center, which hosts your different uh, uh, API authentication layer, the GraphQL layer, and your databases. And on the execution layer, we have the uh, litmus agents that are deployed. We also have certain CRDs that we use, like the uh, chaos operator and a few other CRDs which are essential to detect uh, your target application, uh, where chaos should run and things like that. And this is also essentially the part where your target application is residing. So your, it might be your namespaces, your um, demo application or things like that. So if we dive into the uh, chaos injection architecture, is broken down into three main CRDs, the chaos engine CRD, the chaos experiment CRD, and the chaos result CRD. So start, let's start with this thing called Chaos Hub. So this is our central repository where all our faults are hosted. So things like uh, pod delete, uh, network outage, node drain, any kind of scenario or fault that you want to figure out is located in Chaos Hub. Uh, Chaos Experiment CR is the one where it's like a template, a blueprint of what you want to do. So it will host a structure of your uh, Chaos injection. So it will say, um, how long do you want the chaos to run? What pods do you want to target? Things like that. So chaos engine CR is the one where you can tune these. And once you tune it, chaos operator sits at the middle and it sort of reconciles the entire step and figures out that, okay, you want to target this application. Is it even present in your cluster? Or maybe it is present, but do you have the correct permissions to execute chaos? So it does all those uh, activities via chaos operator. And then it spawns up something called chaos runner. And the chaos runner spawns up multiple chaos jobs. Now these chaos jobs are the ones that are responsible for injecting chaos in your system. Once it is finished, our chaos injection is finished, it'll save it in another CR, which is called chaos result CR. And using this chaos result, you can then export the metrics to some observability tool that you use, uh, maybe Open Telemetry, New Relic, or Prometheus. So you can use this metrics via uh, chaos result, and then you can use it with your own tools. Okay, on the other hand, uh, for the threat detection and response, we'll be using Falco, uh, which is um, um, graduated by CNCF. But back in, um, in February, um, we have like more than 50 million uh, pools, um, and it's uh, main to detect um, threat across Kubernetes containers, hosts, and, and, and cloud environments. So you have here the link to the project page and the link to the GitHub um, of the project. So how it's working under the hood. So Falco is, is deployed um, as an agent, so you can um, uh, use it um, um, for as a daemon set or um, as a daemo running with the Linux system. And there is two methods to run Falco, either using the kernel model or using an eBPF probe. And this eBPF probe or kernel model will be scraping um, the events from the kernel and the beginning buffer there. Um, all the events will go there. And based on that, we'll be reading those events, and it will go to the Falco state engine. When it'll be um, analyzed, um, it will also uh, pass it to see the different parts of the, the event. Um, we erase the event with the different metadata that we gather, either from the container engine, the Kubernetes engine, or uh, as well the cloud engine. And the reason behind this, when we raise an alert later, uh, we'll be able to locate where the, the failure is happening. And also we have rule matching. So you start defining the rules with someone who's writing 
and their ETC, for example, um, uh, some repository that you don't want it to write there. So you'll be um, also uh, doing detection better on different uh, strategies. And finally, uh, when an event happens, it will be uh, raising alerts. So Falco is not just for system calls, it's not just for containers, uh, but it has a pluggable system that you can use whatever the source of the logs or events is coming, whatever is Kubernetes, uh, cloud logs, uh, GitHub, maybe Okta as well, will be this uh, state of, of detection and we have the Falco side Kick, which is another extra project that will define you um, as a kind of UI, and by the end, um, also you have to, to send the event in different uh, notification channel, whatever it's Slack, maybe using a seam like Elastic Shirt, or if it's, if it's high priority, you want to notify uh, someone by email. So just keep in mind, it's not just containers and um, system calls. Today, the, the demo will be running with containers, but you can apply the same stuff with different um, uh, cloud native ecosystems. Um, yeah, actually we can move to the hand-on labs. Um, we have the Git repository um, that we prepared for you. You have the source code there uh, with both um, the case engineering scenario uh, plus the detection rules that we created. Uh, so you can um, test it on your own after the conference. Um, and we have also uh, prepared um, a demo application for you. Uh, it's quite uh, funny, call it potato demo application and it's giving you like a, a nice meal like this with uh, five or six microservices. The main one that is calling uh, for microservices, which is the left and the right arm, the left and um, the right leg, and then the heart. And we'll be using this application to run the chaos um, scenario and um, see how, how the application is behaving and how we are able to detect um, 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 the misconfiguration uh, with, with Falco. So you have also the source code of the application. So this is um, what we have done, uh, part of the, of the lab. Um, we deployed um, Falco, we deployed the litmus case engineering uh, plus the potato application. Uh, then we'll be running the case engineering and we'll be uh, using Falco for, uh, for the security. So it's straightforward process. Oh, sorry. Okay, so the uh, first step would be to install Litmus, which Rafik already mentioned. So once you have everything installed, we are going to run the pod DNS spoof as the first fault and then monitor the application pod health. So while the kiosk is running, we'll see a spoof, a DNS spoof happening. And then once the spoof has happened, because Falco is running in our kernel level, so anything that it changes as part of the chaos will be detected by Falco. So if you take a look at the rules specifically, uh, Rafik, would you want to explain the rules? Yeah, exactly. So the rule, if you can see, a Falco is coming with a rule name with a description. Uh, that's like um, for your team to be able to detect which kind of rule. And then we have the condition. And those conditions are the conditions where the rule should be, um, uh, should be triggered. Uh, you can see here that we are saying if there is any change, if, if, if it's a container and there is a change to slash etc, just uh, resolve the com and make by a user called root. In this case, I would like to, uh, to highlight that there is an access um, that, is, uh, that, is, that is happening on my, my file that is done by this specific user. You can see that we are also displaying the metadata and we can have different priority uh, warning, alert, etc. And then we can also have tags to, uh, to, to locate um, the type of, of, of the rule. So the idea here um, that you can, you can easily deploy this to one of your environment and, and then test it, so. Okay, so let's so we, do a hands-on demo. Yeah, we have the video demo within the presentation, but uh, Cheyenne will, will, will run it um, live right now. Okay. Give me a minute, so we have our application. So let Could you uh, please show the, the repository before? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Third one. So this is the uh, GitHub repository that we already have. It's a part of the slide. So the slides are attached to the shed link as well. So when you open the KubeCon um, schedule, you'll be able to see the slides through there as well. You can go to this repository as uh, also. There's a tiny URL for this. And you'll see the Falco rules, the individual HTTP and the DNS chaos that we have prepared for the, the demo for, and uh, also the architecture for each of them. So if you, let's say, for example, open the DNS chaos, you should be able to see the exact uh, processes, the inputs, and the architecture for the individual uh, demos. So if you want to do a deeper dive, you can do so as well. Cool. So we have our uh, Litmus Chaos uh, deployed. 
and we also have our potato head application deployed. So before moving forward, let me just give you uh, a service breakdown of potato head. So as you can see, sorry, as you can see, we have uh, all these different services and uh, we are specifically going to target the left arm and we are going to spoof it to another service called left arm v2. Now this is particularly something we have deployed. It doesn't have to be. In this case, this service could be anything that a bad actor is deploying. So it could be something in their cluster or something they have deployed in your cluster or like a malware which they can inject into your system. So this is something we want to spoof to or to redirect to. You can see we have uh, this port DNS spoof fault. So this fault came from Chaos Hub, if you remember the Chaos Injection architecture. So what it's doing is it's targeting this app kind of deployment, targeting the demo namespace where my potato head application is residing, and the app label uh, to narrow down the search is name equal to potato main. Now this tune fault is what I uh, talked about, the Chaos Engine CRD. So this is where you're tuning the different aspects of your fault. Uh, and in this case, the, there are some default values. What is of importance is this guy called spoof map. So what spoof map is doing, it's basically taking an input of which service you want to give as an input and which service you want it to spoof. So in this case, we are spoofing potato left arm to potato left arm version two. So this version two, this is because we're doing a demo, we are putting a safe image, but just imagine if this wasn't a safe image and an attacker gets access by doing a DNS spoof. So this is the only change we are doing. There's nothing uh, extra. There are just a few parameters like the duration and all. And for probes, we are just adding a basic probe, which is an HTTP probe checking if the Pareto health application is uh, healthy or not. So that's it. We will just go ahead, save this, and run. So while we run, uh, we uh, the application first installs your chaos faults, and then it moves into the actual chaos execution. So what we should see once the chaos injection starts is uh, let me refresh. So you see the hand, these are different services by the way, the hand, the hand, and the left leg, the right leg. So because the hand is using a different image right now, so it's uh, taking the value from that image, from that service, but once it's spoofed, it should take the value or take the entire uh, image uh, from the other, the version two image. So once chaos is injected, we'll see this hand go up or your data or your application being spoofed. So if I come back. Uh, we'll see the logs that the application is installed. Let's wait for a few minutes. It'll switch to the DNS spoof real soon. So internally, how it works is we have a DNS interceptor. So what it does, it's change the name server. Uh, so that, that's why it writes to the hcresolve.conf, and that is also the Falco rule we are detecting or we are, you know, kept in the bottom so that it can detect that. So it's starting execution. We'll go back. We'll refresh. And we should see the hand getting spoofed. In a minute. Once the, yeah, there you go. So one of the services that was targeted did change. You can see there's some network issues, which is why this main body isn't showing up. But yeah, these are different services, so you can get, you get the point. Uh, so the hand, the left arm, is being spoofed to the other version, which is the arm v2. So that was a part of the uh, chaos injection. Now, since we already also have Falco installed, so Falco is also supposed to detect the same. So if we go back to the terminal and we check for the Falco rule, let's do logs. So we are checking um, for the uh, specific Falco rule and grepping for any warnings that might have come. So if we do that, we'll see that it would detect the access to etc resolve.conf. And, and you know. can see there's a warning and we have specifically added a label called kubecon so that it's easier for you to see. And it says access to etc resolve.conf detected by the root user, which is us. So yeah, there you go. Falco is actually detecting it. And this is an underlying layer, uh, which you should uh, consider uh, keeping because there could be kernel level modifications easily done by a bad actor. So let's jump back to the slides.
Yeah, we have prepared as well a second scenario here um, that you can try uh, by yourself. Uh, we put the demo as well part of, of the slides, which is um, trying to modify a HTTP header in a Kubernetes pod and, um, and, and, and detected by FICO. It's the same way we have the HTTP um, header modifier port that is coming with Litmus. Uh, we run the request against the web, the web application, and then uh, we'll be monitoring the application and using Falco to detect any abnormal activity. This is, can be very useful in web application where we would like to make sure that if anything happened on the request and someone like playing with redirect or location, we'll be able easily to detect uh, those stuff. Um, the rule is, uh, yeah, actually because we are testing the rules, we are trying to, uh, to, to write the file and then we are trying to find if there is any, any direction uh, using uh, the custom HTTP headers um, that we have been, um, we have been uh, implemented. Um, we have the video here. Um, I think we don't have enough time to run, so yeah. We, can, yeah, we can skip this one, but you have the video part of the presentation that we'll share uh, later. And let's go, hey, so for the next level, yeah. Yeah, so if you want to take this to the next level, you should try implementing something like red teaming where you specifically mimic one of your um, targeted uh, chaos injection or you target a specific service and you mimic the same. Uh, we also want to introduce uh, collaboration in this, so there's not just uh, you or you know a small team doing it, so there should be cross-functional collaboration. And you should enhance your automation not just using um, pipelines, but also introducing stuff like GitOps. And uh, you should continuously introduce a feedback loop so as to not being stuck by running it once or twice and then just forgetting about it. So this should be like a continuous process uh, introduced via a feedback loop. And yes. Um, yeah, the takeaways from um, today um, cause uh, you need to keep in mind that uh, the cloud native um, system exceeds traditional security patterns. So you need uh, to keep the same race or the same um, pace as, 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 as those that they are trying to, to hack into your system. Um, you need to know as well that cyber criminals, they are using the same automation tools that you are using to automate your cloud. So um, they, are, they are going with the same speed as you. Uh, we learn how we can um, um, introduce some case engineering to apply a zero trust um, uh, network strategy, and um, yeah, we discover some vulnerabilities. Yeah. We discover vulnerabilities that you can introduce, like check with uh, chaos experiments. So once you do this, you can use your chaos results to discover certain vulnerabilities, and you enhance the detection and response capabilities once you start implementing a process like chaos engineering. And then, of course, you gain uh, actionable zero trust strategies once you do it. So it doesn't always have to be zero trust in the beginning, but you can simulate something uh, like a zero trust environment once you move into the practice of chaos engineering. So to talk about some of the things uh, in the future, our future scope, we want to in, in, uh, in introduce like increased support for chaos against non-KHS infrastructure. So what we saw today was a specific Kubernetes uh, infrastructural chaos, but we want to introduce support for more. Uh, we want more application-specific chaos, so things like Cassandra or things like you know Mongo or something where you target a database or a specific application directly. Uh, we want to improve the chaos SDK, which is used currently to create your user-defined experiments, and also add more and more probe types to support uh, you know a diverse steady-state hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, we can think about uh, adding uh, more case type uh, to the to the platform. Uh, we also put here uh, both the Falco training um, and the Litmus training um, uh, tutorials that you have uh, both on the, on the website. So if someone wanted to, to start uh, playing with uh, within the example that we provided uh, during uh, the demo, that will be a, a very good uh, start for you. I think that's all from us today. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much.